Uh, so without further ado, I'm extremely happy to have Dan. I recommend this book, which is already in our library. Um, and uh, you came to hear him, not me. So Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Robert, and uh, thank you for uh, having me here to talk about my book, and thank you all for coming. Uh, Robert uh, mentioned what to do if there's a natural disaster. Uh, I don't have any guidelines for what to do if you think my talk is a disaster today, so I just have, I'll just have to do my best and, and, and hope you enjoy it. Uh, as Robert mentioned, this is a, a book that is, is now out. It came out in, in July, uh, and so if there are any things that you think I could change, uh, or should change, hold your tongue because I, I don't want to hear it anymore. The, the book is done. Please just enjoy it for what it is. And if you're a graduate student and you want to improve upon it, uh, write a dissertation uh, on the topic. Uh, what is a dynasty? What is a democratic dynasty? So we're, we're familiar with dynasties in the traditional sense, monarchs and, and, and so on. Uh, but dynasties exist in democracies as well. Uh, and I define any, democracy, any, any democratic uh, dynasty as a family with two or more uh, family members elected to uh, national elected office. You could expand this definition to local elected office, but for the purposes of, of the book, I keep it simple and comparable across uh, country cases. So uh, some dynasties in the United States are well known to most people. You have the Adamses, which is the first American political dynasty, uh, the Kennedys, the Bushes, the Gores, uh, and uh, most recently the Clintons. Uh, yet to be determined whether there will be a Trump uh, dynasty, but certainly people uh, talk about it. Um, definitionally, uh, it's, it's quite simple. Imagine a hypothetical senator or representative here, Senator Jones, uh, and in the future, sometime after that person has been elected at least once, uh, they have a family member who runs for office and is elected. I call that a legacy candidate. Uh, this would be equivalent in the context of Japan to what you sometimes hear called a Nisei uh, candidate, a second generation candidate. And then within this broader uh, definition, of legacy candidates, there's a special subset of candidates which uh, we come, uh, refer to as a hereditary candidate or a seshu in, uh, in Japanese. This is a candidate who directly runs to succeed a relative in the very same electoral district. Uh, so it's a, a more direct and um, uh, tightly connected family relationship uh, in, in the same electoral district, but it's a subset of a broader phenomenon uh, which I call legacy candidates. Why should we care about this kind of phenomenon of democratic dynasties? Uh, well, for one, we might have some normative concerns about the functioning of, of, of democracy. So uh, the famous phrase, all men are created equal, uh, if it looks like when we look around the world, some men are uh, created more equal to get into politics than others, uh, maybe there's something going on with the selection process that's not uh, quite fair. We might also have some substantive concerns about the quality of representation. So if some people are uh, predetermined by birth, to get into uh, political power simply because of their family name, uh, they may not have the same kinds of incentives to work hard uh, to represent their voters. They may be a little bit complacent, uh, or they may even be of low quality and nevertheless get into uh, office. And so you might have some real substantive uh, effects of dynastic representation that could be detrimental, detrimental to uh, democracy. Uh, more basically, I'm a political scientist. We like to look around the world and see where there is variation uh, across national, across uh, temporal, across party. Uh, and so this variation in the proportion of dynasties around the world and in different parties is a puzzle in and of itself that people like me like to try to uh, figure out. Uh, and importantly, understanding how dynastic politics works uh, in developed democracies like Japan uh, might shed some light that could be valuable for understanding uh, the process or the evolution of, de of, of democracy in developing contexts like in uh, the Philippines or Thailand, Indonesia, India, uh, where dynasties are perceived as a big problem uh, in contemporary uh, politics today. So why study uh, dynasties in Japan specifically? Probably many of you are aware, uh, Japan has an unusually high proportion of uh, members of the diet who come from political families. Uh, in recent uh, years, it's been about a third. Um, uh, actually, in most recent years, about a quarter of uh, members of the diet, uh, and especially in the Liberal Democratic Party. This has been a controversial issue since uh, at least the late 2000s. Uh, in 2009, uh, the Democratic Party of Japan, in an effort to compete against the LDP, actually outlawed the practice of hereditary succession uh, within uh, the DPJ. Um, the LDP waffled a little bit. It, it, it uh, flirted with the idea of outlawing hereditary succession for candidacies, but then uh, former Prime Minister 
uh, Koizumi uh, uh, Junichiro decided to retire and anoint his son as successor, and so the party made some exceptions, most notably for Koizumi Shinjiro in 2009, and uh, since then has also uh, continued to nominate a few legacy candidates each year. For my purposes as a political scientist, uh, Japan is a really great case for understanding political dynasties because electoral reform in 1994 uh, changed the institutional context of how candidates are elected uh, and also how parties uh, uh, recruit candidates for uh, office. And we can think of this as a great opportunity because Japan is otherwise, over this time period, uh, stable in terms of history and culture. It's not as though anything about Japanese culture or, um, or, or historical um, uh, reasons to favor dynastic succession uh, within families, none of that changed between uh, the, the 1980s and the 1990s to 2000s. The only thing that really changed is this shock of electoral reform. So we can use it as sort of a natural experiment or a, a quasi-experimental design. So I want to show you some data to get our, our, um, our juices flowing here. Uh, this is longitudinal data from the U.S. House of Representatives. This is the proportion of uh, legacy uh, congressmen uh, in the House from the very first Congress, uh, elected in 1788, uh, until uh, the data go up until 2016 here. And what I want to point out is that there's a bit of an increase, and then you reach a ceiling of about 18% uh, uh, in the House, and then there's a long and slow decline to where the average in the last uh, several um, Congresses is about uh, 6 to 8%. Here's Japan. Uh, Japan, of course, became a, a, a real democracy in 1947. In the first election, the share of members of the lower house of Japan's Diet, the House of Representatives, was about the same as in the United States Congress. But you see this rapid increase over time to the peak of over 30% of members of the House of Representatives in the 1980s uh, and 1990s. And then with the DPJ uh, winning control of government in 2009, there's a, a, a rapid uh, drop-off, which recovers slightly after the LDP uh, recovered its majority in 2012. If you want to uh, see even more dynastic politics, take a look at cabinets in Japan. This plots all cabinets from Katayama I in 1947 up to Abe's uh, second reshuffle of his third cabinet. There are a few important time uh, periods here. Uh, the LDP was founded in 1955. Seniority rule was introduced as a norm for promotion within the LDP uh, in the 19, uh, late 1960s. Uh, the LDP was first lost its status as the governing party in 1993 for 10 months and then came back in, uh, into power in a coalition government. And then a second period out of government was from 2009 to 2012. And if we look at this chart, what it shows us with the bars, this is the proportion of cabinet ministers who are political legacies. And the blue line is the proportion of political legacies within the LDP. So in any... Uh, cabinet where the bar is higher than the blue line, that means that legacies are overrepresented relative to their share in the party. And you can see that uh, it's not so drastic or dramatic during the time of, of seniority rule because your promotion was based on how many times you had won, not whether you're dynastic or not. But in more recent cabinets after the LDP was out of government and the electoral reform happened in 1994, uh, in most all of LDP cabinets, uh, dynastic politicians have been much more likely to get promoted to cabinet uh, than their peers. And this is true even controlling for seniority uh, uh, and you know, a number of times having uh, won uh, their re-election. So here's an example. This is the first cabinet of Prime Minister Taro Aso in 2008. Aso himself is a legacy politician. Uh, his grandfather, most notably, was a former Prime Minister uh, Yoshida Shigeru. And in Aso's uh, first cabinet, you have 12 of 18 cabinet ministers, so 67% of the cabinet are political dynasties. Here's another example. This is the first uh, or the second cabinet of uh, current prime minister Shinzo Abe. Of course, Abe himself is a, is a part of a political dynasty. And as with the Aso cabinet, a large proportion, 56% of the, the Abe cabinet uh, uh, was dynastic. Okay. If we look around the world uh, and view Japan in a comparative lens, uh, we can see that Japan is somewhat of um, uh, on the extreme end of the spectrum for dynastic politics. So on the low end of the spectrum, you have places like Germany, uh, where about 2 to 3% of members of the Bundestag are related to other members. And uh, most of those who are 
are related through marriage uh, or they're from long, uh, long-term aristocratic families. The United States is here right in the middle of the pack. Uh, most countries have below 10% of their membership coming from political families. Japan's up here uh, with nearly a, a third of its members coming from political dynasties. This is uh, the average across uh, 1995 to 2016. It's behind developing democracies, um, some that aren't even democracies anymore, like Thailand, uh, the Philippines, and Iceland, where Iceland is a country of 300,000 people. Uh, they even need a book to say whether you're related to somebody else so you don't accidentally marry and have children with a cousin. Uh, and the country is so small and the parliament so small, just 63 seats, that any um, Joe Schmo can walk up right up to the parliament building and take a picture. That's me uh, a few years ago. <laughs> if we look across time, uh, like the United States, we see a pattern of um, a, a increase to a peak, uh, which is sort of mathematical. You can't have dynasties if nobody's been in office you know, before you. Uh, but so you, you see an increase to a peak and then a slow decline in almost all countries, with two exceptions. Uh, one is Ireland, which is here. Uh, and shows a similar pattern to Japan. So both Ireland and Japan have an increase over time in political dynasties that, that stabilizes at a much higher ceiling uh, than most other countries. And, and only in recent years have uh, both Ireland and Japan uh, seen a reduction in political dynasties. In the case of Japan, it's because the LDP lost power in 2009. In the case of Ireland, it's because Fianna Fáil lost power in 2011, following the world financial crisis. And Fianna Fáil is sort of like the equivalent of LDP, uh, but for Ireland, it's a, a conservative uh, dominant party. We can also look across parties. This is the average of um, uh, parties in all of these countries from 1996 to 2016. Uh, we see, again, here there's variation across parties even within the same country. So it's not likely that there's some historical or cultural explanation for any of these countries because you see variation across parties, and presumably the politicians in those parties come from the same culture and, and have the same uh, history, but you see vari variation uh, uh, across them. Here's Japan, and I've highlighted the LDP uh, because if you exclude your party, which was um, composed of uh, former members of the LDP and is predominantly um, uh, LDP in nature, uh, the LDP is not only the most dynastic party in Japan, it's the most dynastic party in the world uh, for the countries uh, I have data. So this introduces a number of puzzles and, and the research agenda that I try to tackle in the book. What explains this variation in dynastic politics across time and space, so countries and parties? Uh, why have dynastic uh, politics uh, persisted in Japan, and, and why have dynasties even grown in number over time? And there are a few key empirical questions that I address in the book. One, do institutional factors, so the rules of the game, how candidates are selected, how uh, uh, candidates are elected, uh, contribute to the emergence of continuance of dynasties, um, emergence or continuance of dynasties and democracies? Do legacy candidates enjoy any advantage uh, in politics, including selection, but also election and promotion uh, to cabinet? And if so, how large is this advantage? And does a high prevalence of dynasties lower the quality of democracy? I said these are the questions that I tackle in the book. A uh, brief, shameless plug, uh, if you go to Stanford University Press website, uh, between now and Sunday, when the sale ends, you can get 35 or 30 percent off uh, with the code WINTER18. Um, by the time this video goes up on YouTube, I guess it'll be too late, but um, <laughs> anybody who watches online will have to uh, buy it at, at the regular sticker price. Okay, just to briefly go over the argument in the book, I argue that members of political dynasties enjoy what I call an inherited political, inv uh, in, uh, an inherited incumbency advantage. And this is analogous uh, to what we uh, know very well in the, in the political science literature uh, of the incumbency advantage. So incumbents tend to get uh, renominated and get reelected at uh, much higher rates uh, than non-incumbents. And what I argue is that being a dynastic candidate is essentially inheriting the incumbency advantage of one's uh, predecessor. And so a dynastic candidate can be up, up to as powerful as uh, their predecessor's uh, advantages that they had as an incumbent. Oops. The variation then across countries and parties can be explained by supply and demand. On the supply side, I argue that relatives of long-serving MPs will be more likely to want to seek a career in politics, so they will want to come forward and run uh, for office. The key here is that this incentive should apply across all cases. It's not as though 
the children of long-serving politicians in Germany uh, should be uh, more likely or less likely than the children of long-serving politicians in Japan to also want to run for office. Uh, children of doctors oftentimes want to become doctors, children of dentists want to become dentists, and so on. Uh, that happens in politics as well. And the longer the, the parent uh, is in politics, the more likely a child will be socialized into uh, the idea that that kind of career would be good for them. That's especially true uh, if the family already has an established history in politics. So if you're the third generation politician, uh, it's easy to see why the fourth generation uh, uh, son or, or nephew or whoever might have a stronger uh, sense of obligation to continue the family pattern. Where I think variation is really coming from is on the demand side of the equation. So I argue that party actors will be more likely to want to seek out a potential legacy candidate when the value to the party of the inherited incumbency advantage is going to be higher. And the key thing here is that uh, even relatives of politicians who serve relatively short amounts of time in office uh, may be uh, desirable for parties to nominate. And institutional factors, namely the electoral system uh, and uh, the candidate recruitment process, can augment or lessen uh, the importance of the inherited incumbency advantage to party actors. Okay? In particular, elections that are candidate-centered rather than party-centered, so elections where voters go to the polling booth and select an individual candidate rather than selecting a party, are going to increase the value of the, the name recognition and other resources that come from uh, being a, a legacy candidate. And when the selection process is decentralized to local elites in local districts rather than centralized into the party leadership, uh, there will also be a greater demand for a legacy successor. Oftentimes it could be because the predecessor, him or herself, is the one who's making the decision in the local district of who should be the successor. Okay, to give a brief overview of today's presentation, I'm going to give a little bit of uh, an overview of the empirical data, um, patterns in Japan. I'll introduce the theory of dynastic selection in, uh, in more um, uh, detail. And then I'm going to look at just one of the substantive chapters from the book, that about selection and how the advantage of dynastic ties in selection varies across institutional con contexts of Japan before and after electoral reform and party reforms in the LDP in the 2000s. Uh, the other chapters, chapter 5, 6, and 7, uh, are in the book if you're interested. I collected a lot of data uh, for this project. Uh, the main data set is uh, the Japan House of Representatives elections data set. It includes over 27,000 observations for over 10,000 candidates, uh, all candidates who ran in any election or by election since 1947. And I have detailed biographical information on the family ties of all candidates, even losing candidates, other people uh, in the data set. Uh, and these data, uh, data are publicly available on, on uh, Harvard's Dataverse if you're interested in using them. And then the comparative data is the dynasties and democracies data set, which is MP level data for 12 different countries. Uh, and these are um, from uh, biographies of MPs. Uh, so it doesn't uh, capture ties between uh, politicians who never uh, were elected, uh, but any MP to MP relationship is included. Here's the empirical record in Japan over time. The thing to point out here is that the share of uh, MPs, so elected MPs, is always higher than the share of candidates. Uh, which suggests that uh, dynastic politicians are more likely to get elected. Uh, already we see an advantage uh, there. Uh, but we also see that the uh, pattern is sort of closely tracking um, each other until the 1990s, and then you see a little bit of a, uh, a split. This is a mosaic plot which shows the uh, fraction of, of, of um, observations in the data across two different uh, variables. So on the x-axis, you have the fraction of candidates who, um, this is MPs, uh, MPs who are affiliated with each of these major parties. The LDP is by far the largest party in Japan from this time period from 1947 to 2014. And then on the y-axis, you have the fraction of legacy MPs in each party. And so here you can see that over 50% of the MPs over time in Japan come from the LDP. And within the LDP, over 25% of the MPs are dynastic. None of the other parties uh, in Japan are as dynastic as the LDP. Here's a geographic variation. You might think, well, maybe there's a rural-urban uh, divide where dynastic politicians are more likely to come from rural areas than urban areas. That's not necessarily the case. The two most dynastic prefectures in Japan are uh, Yamaguchi Prefecture, where the um, Abe or Kishi or Sato uh, family is. There's a number of different um, brothers with uh, uh, names and, and 
they adopt their nephews and, and so on. So it's a very dynastic prefecture as a whole. Uh, but it's just that family that's dominating politics that makes it so uh, dynastic. Another uh, dynastic prefecture is Shimane, where uh, families like the Takeshita family have dominated for many, many years. There are some age and gender differences that are interesting. First, uh, legacies tend to enter parliament as a, at a younger age. So uh, for most people, running for office and getting elected is a difficult challenge. But if you inherit um, the resources of your family member, you can do uh, pretty well and get elected at a, at a younger age. And women are more likely to be legacies than, um, than men. So the figure on this is kind of hard to read, but on the left, this is the percent of um, non-legacy MPs and legacy MPs who are uh, women. So the percentage of legacy MPs who are women is higher than the percentage of non-legacy MPs. And then on the right, you have the percentage of men who are legacy compared to the percentage of women uh, who are legacy. In both cases, it's higher for women. And that's partly because uh, in a system where women face a number of disadvantages to get elected, if you can rely on your family ties to overcome those advantages, uh, you have an easier time getting elected. If we look at prior political experience, just like dynastic politicians are able to enter politics at a younger age, they also are able to enter politics with less experience. Um, key point to take away here is that legacies are, are more likely to have served as a secretary before entering politics rather than serving in local political office as a stepping stone uh, to politics. So they can sort of leapfrog uh, some traditional pathways to uh, power. Are there any education differences? Not necessarily. So legacy politicians aren't necessarily more educated than non-legacy politicians. They are more likely to have attended a private university rather than a public university. Uh, so we might say, well, that might be indicative of perhaps some wealth advantages or class distinctions be between dynastic politicians and non-dynastic politicians. Uh, so we can look at wealth as well. And if we look at the mean um, uh, for all candidates as well as for LDP candidates, it does look as though uh, legacy MPs are richer uh, than non-legacy MPs. They have more uh, financial resources. Uh, but that's because of some particularly influential individuals uh, like Sasakawa Takashi or, or Asotaro, uh, who bring up the mean. If you take the median, the difference between the two groups isn't all that uh, dramatic. This is a different way of looking at it uh, with a, a box and whisker plots. You see a lot of outliers um, for uh, extreme wealth. And when you exclude the outliers here, actually the um, the legacy MPs are not really any more wealthy than uh, non-legacy MPs. So some stylized facts come out of this data exploration. Uh, first, legacies are not geographically concentrated. Uh, they tend to enter politics at a younger age. Women are more likely to be legacies. Uh, legacies are less likely to enter politics vertically through uh, local politics experience. They're not necessarily better educated, but they are more likely to have attended private universities, and they're not universally more wealthy. So in other words, we can't explain the prevalence of dynasties in Japan as dynastic politicians being somehow qualitatively uh, of higher um, or, or better uh, quality than non-dynastic uh, uh, politicians. They're not the best butter of political life in Japan. There's something else that contributes to their high prevalence uh, in the diet. It's also <coughs> not simply a cultural um, uh, explanation. This shows in other fields, other occupations in Japan over time, uh, what is the proportion of, um, this is male respondents to a, a social stratification and mobility survey who reported having the same occupation as their father. And in most other occupations, you see a decline over time. If anything, there's an, an increase uh, in uh, people having the same field as their father at the same time that we see a decrease in Japan in dynasties from the 1990s on. So there's an increase in uh, political occupational inheritance uh, over this time period, while uh, occupational inheritance across other fields is declining. So why do dynasties then emerge? In the general political science literature that existed uh, prior to my book on uh, political dynasties, one of the candidate level arguments was that dynasties have this inherited incumbency advantage, name recognition, uh, resources, uh, scare off effect against uh, high quality challengers. Uh, and there's also an elite theory that is this uh, power begets power. Once a family gets into office uh, once, then they're much more likely to be able to continue their uh, grip on power to the next generation. I argue that this, these explanations at the candidate level are, are, are true, but they're not convincing in a broader sense because they can't explain the variation that we see across countries and parties. It shouldn't be that um, uh, being an incumbent uh, in, in one country uh, is going to matter so much more than being an incumbent in another country that would explain differences in dynastic politics. Uh, 
So what explains those differences across countries, including why there's so many dynasties in Japan? A first supply-side hypothesis, uh, touching back on the uh, brief arguments I introduced earlier, is that long-serving incumbents will be more likely to have a family member who wants to follow them into politics as a candidate. And again, this is not all that surprising. If you're, uh, my, my uh, parents have uh, PhDs and were in academic kind of fields, it's not surprising that I would have been socialized into uh, that world from a young age and envision a future for myself uh, in that kind of field. And same goes with politics. If your father uh, is coming home and talking about politics uh, all through your childhood, you might want to uh, have that career uh, for yourself. And if we look at the relationship between length of time served in office by a politician and the probability that that politician will be succeeded by a child or other relative, we see that across most countries there's an increasing probability of uh, becoming a senior member of a political dynasty the longer you serve in office. What's interesting is that the intercepts, so where the uh, predicted line crosses the y-axis, uh, varies across countries. So in Japan, it's as high as uh, five uh, percent here. Ireland, it's above 10 percent, even at, you know, uh, uh, for a politician who served only one term in office before uh, retiring. A second supply side factor is that incumbents who are part of an existing dynasty will be more likely to have a family member who wants to follow them in politics as a candidate. So imagine a, a company or firm called Smith & Sons. If there's a company called Smith & Sons and it already has sons in the title because there's already been you know, one uh, generational succession before me, if I'm the third generation, I might think, wow, they've got this company called Smith & Sons, maybe make, I should make it and grandsons or something like that and continue the family tradition. Why spoil something that's already continued for two generations? And we can see that just looking across the data um, quite simply, uh, the proportion of uh, incumbents who are themselves already legacy candidates uh, who have a, a future family member run in the, uh, after them is much higher than the proportion of non-legacy candidates who create a dynasty across uh, all of the 12 countries uh, in the data set. I think the demand side factors are more interesting because that's where you get some explanation of why there are so many dynasties in Japan uh, compared to countries like Germany and, and the United States and elsewhere. So I've argued that candidate-centered elections, where voters cast their ballot for an individual candidate rather than for a party, create incentives to nominate candidates with a strong, with strong set of personal vote-earning attributes, things that will get you that uh, individual vote uh, from voters. And such personal vote-earning attributes will be less important when elections are cast or elections are conducted on the basis of parties competing against each other on policy platforms. So voters go into the uh, voting booth and they're choosing a party based on the policies that they hope that party will form if they're able to form a government. So the demand for a legacy candidate will be higher in candidate-centered elections uh, than in party-centered electoral contexts. I also argue that it makes a difference how candidates are selected. So in the political science literature on candidate selection, there's been an argument made that decentralized selection processes may favor local notables who have closer ties to the party actors who are deciding who will run with the party label. In contrast, a centralized process where party leaders in the national headquarters in the capital uh, make the decision allows for party leaders to be more flexible in determining what they want their overall makeup of the party to be. Maybe they don't want a party that's completely dominated by local notables, maybe they want to have more uh, policy experts or more women or more young people or some diversification in what their, their overall character of the party looks like. They can't make those changes unless they have control over the nomination in a centralized fashion. So the demand for a legacy candidate will be higher where the candidate selection process and decision are decentralized to local actors. So now we'll look at Japan and how it's, how it's changed over time. As many of you may know, up until 1994, uh, Japan had an electoral system called the Single Non-Transferable Vote Multi-Member District System, or, or the Chu um, uh, system in, in Japanese, uh, where if a party like the LDP wanted to win a majority of seats in the legislature, it was forced to run multiple candidates in a given district. So this meant that there was intra-party competition uh, for votes within a given district. So any given LDP candidate couldn't run on the basis of their party label. They couldn't say, vote for me because I'm LDP. They had to say, vote for me because I'm Watanabe or I'm Yoshida, and these are the characteristics I have. So there was an extremely candidate-centered uh, electoral environment, particularly for LDP candidates. And it was also very decentralized in terms of candidate selection. The individual candidates would build up support groups over time to help them win elections, these are known as koenkai. And when the 
candidate retired or died, it was most often the Koenkai that would determine who would be the candidate in the next election to succeed them. And for the Koenkai, it was easy to rally around a son uh, or other relative to keep that machine going. So you see over time an increase in both legacy and hereditary candidates, light, blue, or light uh, purple here is legacy, and the subset of, of that is in dark purple are the, those who directly inherited their seats from a relative. Uh, that increased over time in the LDP, also in the JSP, but to a lesser extent, and the DSP, the Democratic Socialist Party, that's the Japan Socialist Party, uh, very few in uh, Komeito. Then in 1994, this is maybe not uh, uh, news to uh, many of you, uh, but Japan experienced a major electoral reform. It shifted to a system called the mixed member majoritarian system, which combines 300, uh, now 289, single member district um, uh, races uh, with uh, candidates elected through first past the post, the British style system, and then closed list, uh, party list PR, proportional representation uh, in 11 regional blocks. This completely eliminates intra-party competition. No longer uh, do LDP candidates have to compete against each other for personal votes. They can campaign on the basis of their party label, the fact that they're an LDP. There's no other LDP candidate in the district. And this reform was expected to produce more party and policy-oriented campaigns. And most of LDP candidates are also dual-listed across tiers, so it mitigates some of the risk to the party to nominating diverse types of candidates who, who might not be the uh, traditional type. The LDP, uh, uh, this, this reform produced party-centered elections by at least 2003. Uh, the DPJ emerged as a challenger to the LDP, and the LDP uh, began to uh, get worried. And they responded to the electoral threat with party reforms in 2004 that centralized the candidate selection process so that the party could take uh, more of a, of a role in determining its makeup. We see this reflected in gender changes over time. Uh, the orange squares here are the, is the percentage of, of women nominated by the LDP. It's almost zero in the 1980s and 90s. In fact, I think there were four uh, new uh, women who were nominated by the LDP, and three of them were dynastic. After a reform uh, by the dashed line here, there's an increase in the number of women as the LDP has had incentives to diversify its party brand. Um, you know, fewer, fewer uh, men and more women, more young people and policy experts and so on. I'll skip this. These are just some examples of the new types of candidates that the LDP has nominated. This summarizes um, the two environments uh, that we're looking at in Japan. In the pre-reform period, elections had intra-party competition. They were candidate-centered, and there was a need for a strong personal vote earning attributes. Candidate selection was decentralized. The Koenkai was dominant, and local elites could co-opt the process. After reform, there's no more intra-party competition. It's a more party-centered system, and dual listing across tiers limits risk to parties. And candidate selection is um, more centralized, especially within the DPJ, and the party is more dominate, dominant. So here's the headline results. We have uh, ex uh, expectations then that this might decrease patterns in dynastic politics, and we see that. So for all candidates, we see an immediate drop for the LDP, and for first-time candidates, we see a huge drop from about 50% on average uh, to an average of about 10 to 12%. Across uh, the, the periods as well, Here's SNTV, here's the before reform under first past the post SMD, here's after reform under first past the post SMD, and here's the closed list PR tier. There's an expected um, pattern of a decrease in the proportion of new dynastic politicians uh, across these periods. And I'll skip to the final uh, figure. If we, if we plot the probability that an outgoing incumbent will uh, be succeeded in office by a family member, with a given number of wins, so with a, with a uh, uh, set incumbency advantage, here's what we find. Um, the x-axis here shows the uh, institutional environment, SNTV, first past the post before reform, first past the post second reform, and the number of wins. So between 0 and 2, 3 and 7, 8 to 10, or 11 uh, plus. What we see is that for 11 plus wins, there's basically no statistically there's no statistically there's no significant uh, statistical difference between um, the pre-reform period and the post-reform period. Long-serving incumbents are just as likely to have their sons or other relatives succeed them today as they were um, in the 1980s. But for weaker incumbents, those who retire or lose after you know, uh, zero to two uh, or up to seven wins, there's a, a significant drop in the probability that those weaker incumbents will be succeeded by a family member in the new system. So it actually, the predicted probability of succession of the old system was 20% for a candidate with the average number of wins. It's dropped to 
uh, and similar probabilities at longer ten tenures. So I will leave it there and start the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for a nice uh, informative thing. In Japan, I think uh, the candidate to be chosen by party in their local uh, local is determined by sort of inheritance, so the supporting group is the same uh, region. But the UK is a bit different, right? So that's how that might affect uh, the election. Yeah, thank you. So that's, um, the, in the UK, the central party leadership has much more control over who will get the candidate nomination. Uh, and you often see candidates who get parachuted into the different districts. And the uh, proportion of dynastic candidates in the UK is only about 6%. It's, it's, it's quite low compared to Japan. Uh, in Japan, since the reforms in the LDP in the, in the 2000s that introduced a, a system of recruitment called COBOL, or open recruitment, you still have the uh, process uh, taking place locally, uh, but there is an interview that is overseen by the central LDP headquarters, and there's much more influence by the party leaders in determining the outcome. And just anecdotally, uh, through interview research, I, I documented that there are a number of cases where a would-be hereditary successor wanted to get the nomination and uh, was denied the nomination through the process of this more centralized uh, selection uh, uh, reform uh, within the LDP. And so it's changing slowly to be more like the UK, uh, but the process still uh, involves local uh, voices and, and, uh, and input. Thank you. Many of your graphs begin in 1947, understandably. Please comment offhand how, about how Meiji constitution dynasties operated in the then lower house and about post-war political dynasties that come out of Meiji constitution era political dynasties. Right, so um, I don't have, in the, in the data I showed, I don't have the pre-war period uh, but the the ties that I the, the ties that I code do include relationships to pre-war politicians, uh, and if you look at the um, the early periods, there there is actually quite a few. One of the reasons why there are quite a few dynastic politicians immediately off the bat in uh, in the first election in 1947 uh, was in part because the U.S. occupation purged a number of um, party politicians who were active in the pre-war period, and uh, they had their brothers or other relatives stand in as, as uh, substitutes while they were purged. And what happened is in 1952, when the purge was lifted, many of these pre-war party politicians came back and reclaimed their seats, and their, you know, their brothers retired. Um, so even in the uh, first uh, few parliaments uh, in, in the post-war period, uh, you have quite a few uh, dynasties that are sort of uh, seat warmers. Uh, in the uh, House of Peers, of course, it was all dynastic, um, no, mainly dynastic. In the House of Representatives in the pre-war period, uh, although I don't have uh, uh, data, my understanding is that uh, from reading some of the Japanese literature on, on this uh, time period is that many of the first um, uh, generations of, of Japan's political dynasties were elected in 1925 uh, when universal male suffrage was uh, enacted. and. Um, more candidates were allowed to, to, to run. Good evening. Thank you very much for your fascinating presentation. I have one remark and one question. The first is when you say it's not geography correlated to rural urban division, if I'm not mistaking, the regions you are pointing out are where the winners of the Boshin Wars and end of the Bakufu era are coming from. So maybe this dynastical power was rooted in their closeness to the coming imperial power that came after the end of the Bakufu era. And my question is, um, you did, but maybe you want to do it, you did not address the reaction of the audience and voters towards this dynastical, very dynastical power and uh, how it may be an influence over um, cu the current abstention rates among the younger generation? Mm -hmm. And what do you think it can play a role also in the um, maybe potential win, it did not happen, of populist party like the ones uh, Hashimoto Toru from Osaka City tried to bite up? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for those comments. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know that there's any, I wouldn't read too much into the geographic patterns here. You don't see in Satsuma, for example, a greater proportion of dynasties than, than elsewhere. And if, I, if you control in the, in the analyses in the book, I control for um, a rural versus urban cleavage with more fine-grained data at the electoral district level. There's nothing about urban-rural uh, differences. Uh, I don't know that, um, I don't know if I would uh, expect the um, historical legacies of uh, the Meiji Restoration or any other uh, period to, to affect uh, patterns today, but uh, it's something that somebody could easily uh, look at. In terms of voters' attitudes, the, ch the chapter in the book on elections uh, has two types of surveys measuring voters' attitudes towards dynastic politicians. And the key and most interesting thing there is if you ask voters directly, do you uh, approve of dynastic candidates? Uh, they say no. Uh, actually, dynastic candidates are among the, the least popular uh, candidates when you ask in the abstract, do you approve of them? Uh, uh, along with celebrity or tarento candidates, they're not very popular. But if you use a survey technique called conjoint analysis, where you put all of the attributes together in a hypothetical uh, candidate that includes lots of different attributes, uh, then dynastic ties are no longer as, as uh, problematic. Um, and it seems that voters don't like the idea of dynastic politics in the abstract, uh, but they don't mind their own local dynastic politician. They'll continue to vote for him. And it's sort of like how in the United States, where people really don't like Congress, but they like their own congressman. Uh, you can think of it as, as sort of bundled up with other things about the candidate that are not their identity. They like the, the, the benefits that come back to the district, or they like the familiarity, and so on. I, I think one of your slides, you suggested that there's not really a cultural, particularly Japanese thing, because the inherited professions are declining in Japan. I, I, I just as a impression of living in Japan, you know, I went with some friends to the countryside, stayed in Onsen Inn, and the person who greeted us was the 13th generation. Last week I went and got some ceramic souvenirs, and the person running the shop was the fourth generation. Um, and, you, you, you know, I, I work with lawyers, I'm teaching a law school, and I see lots of students who are going into the profession because they're going to take over their father or their uncle's practice or something. It does seem to me very different than certainly the American experience. Um, so um, I wonder if, if they're, they're just smaller areas of the country, of the economy, that are subject to this you know, doctors, lawyers, politicians, certain types of family businesses, and that's a, that's a, it's no longer the case in agriculture, it's a shrinking part of the economy, but it's still a very strong part of the culture, it's just my impression. Yeah, so the, the argument I make, so in these data you can actually break them down by uh, occupation, and one of the most dynastic occupations is Shinto priest. Uh, in, 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 in Japan. And, and, uh, and Buddhist priests as well. Yes. Yeah, and so the, the, the odds of a Buddhist uh, or Shinto priest having their uh, son in the same profession is really high, much higher than uh, most other occupations. The key takeaway um, for my argument is that that occupational inheritance uh, in the case of politics can't be explained by a culture alone, that, that the institutions are doing something. Otherwise, you wouldn't expect to see such dramatic changes when the institutions change, because culture didn't change overnight within, within politics. Um, and you wouldn't also expect to see such dramatic differences across parties, because presumably LDP politicians are Japanese, just like you know, uh, the Socialist Party uh, candidates are also Japanese. Uh, there may be some ideological differences, but certainly not cultural differences. And so that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to point out here. Yes, please use the microphone. So is Japan getting lower quality of leadership due to the dynasties? That's a good question. Uh, so what I actually argue is that uh, in some ways there's, there's room for optimism uh, in that, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the final slide, the proportion of, uh, or the, the, prob the probability of having a new um, dynasty forming uh, has not changed much at the uh, sort of higher ends of seniority. So uh, Prime Minister Koizumi, uh, when he retired, uh, his son 
uh, Shinjiro Koizumi came in, most of the new dynastic politicians are the sons of long-serving, um, extremely powerful, successful uh, politicians who have served in cabinet, some, many of them prime ministers. Uh, those who uh, are less powerful or less successful as politicians are less likely to have a family member succeed them in office. And one sort of positive spin you can put on that is that Japan is now selecting for or selecting on the right type of dynasty, these sort of long, uh, they're, they're selecting on the Kennedys and Bushes uh, and, and Hatoyamas of the, of the world rather than the local um, uh, kind of machine style uh, family politics that's just going to be uh, stuck at the local district level and never have any higher national uh, aspirations. And so that may be good for uh, Japanese politics. In general though, um, the, given that the proportion of new dynasties has, has shrunk to about 10 to 12 percent, that means Japan is looking a lot more like those, uh, the rest of the world, the, the normal countries that have uh, a share of, of political dynasties between you know, 5 and 10 percent. Uh, so that may be encouraging as well if you want to you know, uh, evaluate the, the trends. Do I need to use the mic? Okay. If you can, I can I'll, I'll project. <laughs> I'll project. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, one thing is, is, I want to understand your central thesis. It, it, the reason why Japan is outlier, Ireland and Japan are outlier, but let's focus on Japan. It, what, what's the main, I want to, my first question is, what's, the main, what's, what's your main thesis of why Japan is the outlier as opposed to other countries? Yeah, so the, the, second part, yeah. the second part of that question is, do you think part of it is the, is the election system where you have a, you vote for a person and you also vote for a party in the election system so that if you have the party wins a certain percentage, they have a certain number of protected, I guess to call the management, uh, politicians that can't get voted out, for example, Abisan can't get voted out because he's part of the management. He's part of the list. He, I think he's number maybe number one on the list of the protected politicians on the proportional voting system. Well, I think Abe and most other party leaders don't list themselves on the party list. They have to win their single member district seat, uh, or else they're out. But they have such power and, and strength in their district that they never. Uh, but uh, but in terms lose. of the people that are on the list, these are protected people. Some of so them are they don't they don't have to really get the vote. So my first question. Can you just very briefly explain your central thesis of why it's so yeah. different? And second, ask, uh, I want to know if you think it, it, that the, the proportionality voting, the, the proportional voting part in the Japan system compared to like the U.S., if that plays a part in protecting mm -hmm. legacies. Yeah, that's both good questions. So to answer your first question, the key thing to take away is the intra-party competition within the party. So the in, in places like the U.K. and the United States, there's only one uh, Democrat or conservative or you know labor or, or Republican running in each district so they can campaign and be elected on the basis of their party label uh, more so than in uh, systems like Japan's STV uh, central uh, single transferable vote or or uh, sorry Ireland's single transferable vote or Japan's STV where for any party that wanted to win more than one seat they had to run multiple candidates in the same district uh, which meant that those candidates were competing against each other for uh, votes within their broader party ideology, uh, they had to say, you know, don't just vote for me because I'm LDP or Fianna Fáil or, or Fine Gael, uh, vote for me because I have these particular uh, qualities. So that intra-party competition is the key to understanding why dynasties grew over time uh, in both Japan and Ireland. Um, if, if my theory is correct, and we can see with uh, you know, a certain amount of time, uh, political dynasties should continue to exist at higher levels in Ireland where there has been no uh, electoral reform uh, than in Japan where there's been electoral reform. Uh, and so far, it looks like that's, that's the case. There was a drop in 2011 uh, when Fianna Fáil lost uh, a huge number of seats. Uh, but in 2016, uh, a huge chunk of Fianna Fáil's new candidates were still dynastic. Uh, and they had an introduction of a gender quota, which exacerbated uh, the problem because they then had to uh, recruit more women. And they ended up re recruiting a lot of their daughters and uh, nieces to, to run. So Ireland remains very dynastic in, in, in character. Uh, Japan is, is rapidly approaching uh, uh, countries like the, the UK and Canada. Um, the existence of the proportional representation tier helps incumbents uh, keep their seats in general. If they lose their district race, they can still uh, get a seat. Um, I don't know that it, it uh, in and of itself, um, helps new dynastic politicians, but it, it maybe keeps uh, the existing ones uh, in office for, for longer. Um, Many of the new dynastic politicians who aren't of high quality end up losing altogether. 
uh, and those who are getting nominated uh, tend to win their single member district race. Um, those who lose their single member district race but get a seat through PR are much less likely to have a future family member succeed them. So there's something about having a, a strong grip on a single member district as an incumbent uh, that, is tied, that is tied to yeah, predicting hereditary succession under the new uh, context. Nan, um, thank you for a great presentation. I have uh, one big question and one small question. The bigger question is, do you think there's a linkage between the diminished uh, strength of hereditary succession and the diminished power of factions in the LDP? That is, that, that the factional system, the LDP, to some degree, depended on the, uh, uh, the strength of uh, hereditary succession and make, creating uh, leaders who are somewhat immune, if you will, to uh, to being ousted from office. Mm -hmm. And the small question is, I noticed that the Kiosanto, that the JCP had no hereditary succession. Is that a, a rule within the party that creates that or some, some policy that they have that they don't allow it to take place? Because it's like zero, I think. The JCP is a tricky case, so those are the cases that I could verify. There are some JCP candidates that have similar names, and actually the JCP had a kind of funny practice where they would nominate um, candidates with similar names and also nominate uh, challengers to incumbent LDP politicians who had similar last names to try to <laughs> siphon off some um, mistaken votes. So in, in Japan, if you go and vote, you have to write the name of the candidate out. And if, you, if two candidates have the same name, um, and it's not clear who is supposed to get the vote. It gets divided proportionally uh, based on the, the rest of the vote. So if, if a voter just writes, you know, Snyder, and there's two Snyders running, then um, it gets split. And so there's some strategy to having candidates with similar names. But those are the verified um, uh, ones that I could find. In term, Komeito is, is very surprising. Though both of those parties are. Uh, parties that, one, um, almost never ran candidates against each other, so there was no intra-party competition. Uh, the, the JCP only had intra-party competition in, in uh, Kyoto, uh, and they had very centralized candidate selection processes. So uh, when Komeito nominates a candidate, uh, it's, it's usually because um, Ikeda Daisaku or somebody in the party leadership, uh, Ikeda Daisaku is not having very much influence over candidate selection these days, but somebody in the um, Soko Gakkai organization um, or Soka University uh, has an eye on somebody who's up and coming in, in the, um, in the, in the Soka Gakkai organizations and they recommend them to somebody in Komeito leadership. And so many of the Komeito candidates who I've uh, interviewed in, in the process of, of writing this book uh, have told me that they had no intention of running until they randomly got a call uh, one day uh, from somebody high up in the Soka Gakkai organization saying, we think you should run for, uh, uh, for office. Uh, and they view it as their, their civic duty or their koboku to to, to go and run. Um, and so that centralized process, I think, is also um, consistent with the idea that the party's stronger. It's not about individual uh, you know, families and their control over their local uh, fiefdoms. For factions, I controlled for factions in all of the analyses in the books, and I didn't find anything uh, interesting about uh, factions, whether there's some factions that are more dynastic than others, or whether uh, you know, factional ties have some importance to predicting succession. It's just a, uh, a related aspect of Japanese politics, but not um, uh, causal. It's sort of two, two outcomes. The candidate-centered um, sing single non-transferable vote system uh, encouraged both factions and the formation of dynasties, and money politics, and a number of other uh, ailments of the, the pre-reform pre uh, system. Thank you. Very comprehensive and, and uh, um, well-presented uh, presentation. I sort of wish we would have had time for all of those slides that you had to rush through, <laughs> including maybe if you didn't mind putting up that si final slide that said conclusions. Uh, that's, but that's I have true. two brief questions or, or comments. One is um, I noticed that throughout your, converse, uh, your presentation, you referenced the sons or the nephews. But then at some point, there was a slide that said there was a very high percentage or a greater probability of women and so I'm just curious to know, since you didn't mention specific uh, uh, instances of the women, uh, and if that is indeed uh, a, a trend in the legacies, um, uh, the dynasties here in Japan, uh, if you could comment on that a little bit. Second, 
And this is something, to the, uh, something about the cultural element. If we look at the Confucian world order, China doesn't have uh, a democratic system, so you can't include them, but Korea and Taiwan, and maybe at some point China and Vietnam, um, and the sense of a familial uh, legacy, and uh, the atotsugi here in Japan in terms of taking the profession of the, of the parents, or the, usually the father, um, uh, it would be fascinating, probably not yet available, but in Korea and Taiwan, where there have been the emergence of democratic systems, whether or not there is a, a larger percentage of uh, legacy candidates and or, and or dynasties in those fairly recent democracies uh, next door in South Korea and in Taiwan. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. And actually, I should mention that um, a great deal of my field work for this uh, project was done while I was a Fulbright scholar, uh, and you were the director. So thank you very much for your uh, support at that time. Um, the first question about gender uh, is important, and actually I have a paper that I'm working on that uses the gender data um, uh, to look at, at, at dynamics in dynastic politics. And uh, essentially what we find is that there's a, a relationship with time. So when women are underrepresented uh, in politics, having a dynastic family tie is a, a way for, for women to get into politics. And so early on, if you look at the history of any given uh, democracy, um, the first women to enter into politics are, are dramatically more likely to be dynastic. Uh, but they essentially break the, the glass ceiling, and later on, uh, women are, are uh, just as, or, or no more likely to be dynastic than men. And they're less likely to be reliant on the, um, the quality or the um, you know, long-term power of a male predecessor uh, than a, a, a would-be male dynastic uh, candidate. And that's true for Japan, and it's true for most other uh, countries in the, in the comparative data that I've collected. So there is a, a temporal um, uh, factor with, with gender and dynasties as well. Um, you mentioned Korea and Taiwan, and I think it's, it's, they would be a very interesting uh, comparison. I only have the sort of top level uh, data for uh, Korea and Taiwan, but Taiwan looks a lot like Japan. There are lots of dynasties there. Uh, Korea, surprisingly, had very few. And one of the things that's going on in Korea, I think, is that there's so much turnover. Uh, incumbents don't uh, stick around very long. And so there's not a whole lot of time for that socialization into politics to happen um, in, in, in the case of Korea. Hi, Dan. Thanks for a characteristically clear and comprehensive uh, and extremely well-supported uh, presentation. 27,000 biographies, that's a lot of biographies to read. Congratulations. I didn't read them all. <laughs> <laughs> I had two serious questions and a little quixotic one. The serious one first is about the cabinet. In some ways, your, your story is almost disappointing. It, it's a declining industry. You're studying a declining industry, but you find a big exception in the cabinet. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more, and particularly at a completely anecdotal level, it seems like there are quite a few of the powerhouse dynasty people who are educated in the US, wealthy. They seem to be somewhat exceptions. So could you say more about this subset of your population? The second uh, semi-serious question is about uh, Thailand and Philippines, because you refer to them as young democracies rather than using your two main variables of candidate-centered and, um, and decentralized nomination procedures. So if you could just say a little bit more about how those three things interact. The quixotic question is about the, the, the cause of uh, decentralized nomination processes. You're taking it as exogenous, just given that's the way it is. Is there any possibility that feudal countries like Japan, where local notables were relatively powerful, were able to produce or, or, or lean on a system so that it becomes more locally uh, oriented than countries with, uh, say, a more centralized political system? Thanks. Uh, good. So the, um, the first, the first, I'm going to answer the third question first because uh, I think it's a good question, um, and I don't have the historical data to, to test it. So I think that uh, that's a good dissertation project for, for somebody to, to come along with. But certainly, the the uh, single non-transferable vote system was first um, chosen by oligarchs in, after the major restoration, in part to uh, discourage the formation of strong parties. Um, and then in 1947, when Yoshida Shigeru convinced the uh, occupation authorities to return to the SNTV system, uh, 
uh, from the limited vote system with you know, large districts that was used in the first election in 1946, it was because there were so many candidates and parties that were elected in 1946 that it was viewed as potentially um, uh, unrestful or uh, unstable. Uh, and the argument was made that SNTV would, would shrink the number of parties, and, and it did. Um, so those are political explanations for the choice of the system. I don't know that they revolved around dynastic considerations, but, um, uh, but, but it's something that's worth looking into. On uh, the Thailand and the Philippines, I guess I consider it to be less surprising that in a country where the average income that somebody could learn, earn outside of politics uh, might be less than the average income that you could earn inside politics. If somebody gets into politics and has a career, then they'll want to hold on to that, uh, that uh, position of power. And so maybe the, the Philippines and the Thailand, are, uh, Thailand are, are more like any of these other countries that are at earlier developing periods in their, in their history. And so it's more surprising that a country like Japan that's economically developed, has a long uh, democratic history, would see it, an increase in dynasties over time rather than this regular pattern. If we were to uh, watch Thailand or the Philippines uh, develop over time, maybe we would expect to see this slow, uh, gradual decrease. Or if the institutions are uh, uh, more permissive to the, the you know, capture of, of uh, political power by dynasties, then it would be more like Japan, where there's a, where there's an increase. Uh, maybe it's too soon to say that, or I'd need more. Well, but there's uh, been an electoral change in Thailand, so that's a paper you can assign to one of your graduate students. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> uh, and then finally, on the on cabinet, the interesting thing about cabinet is, if we um, introduce the distinction within legacy candidates of hereditary candidates and legacy candidates, where hereditary candidates are a subset of legacy candidates. But we can also consider a distinction between legacy candidates whose predecessors have ne never served in cabinet themselves uh, and legacy candidates whose predecessors had served in cabinet, and we call those cabinet legacies. And the others are sort of run-of-the-mill run legacies. And if you, if you divide the sample to, to include uh, both of those types, what you see is that uh, regular run-of-the-mill legacies have no advantage in getting into cabinet. Only cabinet legacies are advantaged in getting promoted. And it could be because, uh, it's not because of seniority. So after controlling for seniority, there's only an advantage for cabinet legacies. And it could be because of some network advantages in uh, the party. It could be because these cabinet legacies have some kind of other uh, higher social skills or uh, can project some kind of power. Uh, or it could just be because um, their predecessors have a reputation and experience in the cabinet, so there's some uh, potential um, uh, yardstick for how they themselves might perform uh, if they were to be appointed as well. Uh, that's, I think, a little bit hard to disentangle, but uh, you know, again, if, if anybody can figure it out, they have a good uh, research paper I think they can write. Thanks. Thank you for your interesting uh, presentation. I'm just wondering, um, have you noticed if candidates who win through this inherited incumbency advantage, are they more ambitious or likely to take risks in pushing forth uh, policies or their own political agendas since they have this security or uh, comfort? Yeah, the only, so I've looked at the legislative um, activity uh, data, and the only difference I find that's, um, uh, not all that um, uh, huge and not all that exciting is that these cabinet legacies, who I mentioned before, those whose predecessors served in cabinet before them, uh, are, are slightly more likely to be active in um, speaking in, in uh, the diet and in committees um, than non-cabinet legacies. And it could be because they have more um, familiarity with the process and they can hit the ground running on, on day one because of their family history. Uh, but I don't know the exact mechanism behind it. That's the only difference that I see in terms of legislative activity. Great. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just uh, wanted to quickly ask you about the U.S. Uh, dynasties, because obviously in 2016, it looks like we got Trump because of the kickback against the Bushes and the Clintons and, and, and the Pelosi's, although that doesn't seem to have worked out. I was just wondering if you think that could you know, could that happen in Japan with the Asos, the, Ato, the Hatoyamas, the Abes, et cetera? Could, could the electorate get really tired of this, uh, this, these, this bunch of, of guys at, at some point? Yeah, I, I, I personally had hoped that the 2016 election would come down to Clinton versus Bush just so I could sell more copies of my book. <laughs> but, it, but it turned out that celebrity trumped 
uh, dynasty in that um, in that contest. And um, you see around the world some countries where dynastic leadership seems to be doing just fine, Abe in Japan or Trudeau in, in uh, Canada, and then other places, uh, even in the Philippines, uh, which long had dynastic presidents, um, Duterte came in as a non-dynastic politician on, uh, you know, campaigning on populist appeals and, and uh, against the establishment dynastic class and, and won. Uh, whether that will happen in more uh, countries, I think, is, a, is an open question. Uh, but you also saw in Indonesia uh, the defeat of a dynastic uh, candidate, um, I think the son-in-law of Suharto, um, to a non-dynastic candidate. So it's happening in some places, uh, India as well, um, uh, Gandhi was rejected in favor of Modi in, in um, uh, more recent election. Um, if that is, uh, I think there are probably Americanists who work on American politics would probably say that uh, rejection of Clinton because of her dynastic family ties is probably not the whole story in terms of why Trump won. Um, but whether that can happen in Japan, I think, is, a, is an open question. Um, Professor, thank you for the illuminating um, presentation. And I have one question regarding the implication of this um, legacy politician um, phenomenon, especially how these uh, politicians behave. So do you see these politicians behave simil similarly like their predecessors? For example, propose similar policies, embrace fully embrace their identity, or do you see they seem to um, set themselves apart from their predecessors and um, behave differently. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a great question, in part because I thought of that, and it's in the book. So I have a, I have a ready uh, answer for you. Uh, if you look at, so every candidate who runs for office in Japan can produce a candidate manifesto, Senkyo Koho, that, um, that they publish in, in, in newspapers before the election. And it gives their biography and some uh, policy points. And in the book, uh, I performed a, a, an analysis of the, the text of those um, candidate-level manifestos. And uh, essentially what I found was that if an incumbent uh, runs again, um, their manifesto in the next election is quite similar to their manifesto in the previous election. So incumbents tend to talk about the same things over and over again. But then you have two types of succession. An incumbent can retire and be replaced by a non-relative, so maybe it's a secretary or some outsider, or they can retire and be replaced by a family member, so it's a, a kin succession, a hereditary succession. And the similarity between the two manifestos is, is much more sim much uh, closer uh, when it's a hereditary succession than when it's a non-hereditary succession. So the hereditary successor's policy positions, what they talk about in elections in their manifestos, looks a lot more like an incumbent running again uh, than uh, when there's a, a non-hereditary succession. So they are, in, to some extent, uh, either recycling or um, or uh, digging in on the policy positions of their of their predecessors, and this represents, um, optimistically, you could say that this is a form of continuity and representation for voters. That voters, if they liked the kinds of policies that the predecessors were pursuing, voting for the successor is a way to continue that kind of representation. Uh, thank you very much for the great presentation. You yeah, got a lot of information, so not very easy to comment this one. We got so many topics to think about more. Uh, I just would like to ask a simple question, which is about the relationship between the power and the, uh, the dynasties. Uh, in the media, uh, journal journalism at least, there is a discourse in particular regarding the so-called sesshu the uh, direct, direct inheritance system. And in most cases, it's uh, criticized in, in the context that the, the in, inheriting the juniors are incapable of governing more effect, uh, effectively, or therefore the governing capability is getting you know, declining. Such kind of discourse is quite prevalent in this country. I'm not sure whether this kind of you know, the, uh, selling discourse is very correct, but the, how do you assess the relationship between the governing capability of Japan or beyond than the so dynasties? I guess I haven't performed any kind of systematic analysis, but anecdotally, there can be um, pretty clumsy leaders who are non-dynastic and pretty clumsy leaders who are dynastic. And even in Japan, in the past uh, seven prime ministers, uh, those who were who were non-dynastic were Noda and uh, Khan, and I don't think that Noda or Khan escaped um, any criticism for their for their leadership simply because they weren't dynastic. And Abe, who is uh, a dynastic fourth or fifth generation politician, has uh, you know had a hiccup in his first time in office, but has now managed to hold on to power uh, 
uh, and is in line to become the longest serving prime minister in Japan and has pretty stable leadership. So I think that trying to draw any kind of systematic conclusions would be uh, a challenge. Yeah. Thank you very much. Question. You've, your research shows that, in a way, there's a bifurcated uh, future for dynastic politicians. If you're from the lower half of a dynastic world, you know, just you know, daddy was a member of the diet for a few uh, terms, or you just first generation nephew, things have gone downhill. You're less likely to be able to inherit a seat or to be a legacy uh, successor of your father-in-law, uncle. If you are ever from a class A dynasty, uh, the Kishis, uh, the Aso, it seems things are still going very well. So from the point of view of the most prestigious dynasties, isn't it kind of an advantage? Because what you've done is you've gotten rid of other members of the nobility. I mean, it's kind of like if you're a duke and suddenly they abolish all titles of nobility for barons, for counts, for everything, but not for dukes. So you're the only one left. So, I mean, obviously it's very hard to predict the, the future. That's why it's better to be a historian than a futurologist. But couldn't you argue that for the children, the Koizumi juniors and others, actually things have gone up because they belong to a very, very select group now uh, and aren't competing with lower or even mid-level legacy types. Yeah, uh, that's, that's true. There are still plenty of um, A-level dynasties for them to compete against, but, um, but certainly there's, there's talk of Koizumi Shinjiro being uh, a fu future prime minister even before he you know, won his second you know, re-election, I think. So um, there, there's certainly a, a, a uh, expectation that some of the you know, very, very strong new dynasties that are, that are still emerging uh, will have a, a role in leadership in the LDP in the, in the future. Um, I would guess that if we were to uh, analyze what's the probability that any given politician will be promoted to cabinet, there'll still be a huge advantage for the types of dynasties that are being recruited on now. Uh, people like Koizumi Shinjiro will still be uh, much more heavily favored to get promoted into leadership positions than their peers. Uh, and that's only going to be increased by the fact that they have fewer sort of local level uh, run-of-the-mill dynasties, if you will, um, to compete against. I can just shout, I think. Um, I'm interested in whether you can use some of your other data to shed more light on this idea of the extent to which this is cultural in Japan and that uh, the high level. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking of the data on other professions. So you have a slide in there that shows the declining proportion of men who are in the same professions or jobs as their fathers in Japan. Is there data across other countries on those other professions for start? And then is there, you said that you can break that data down and look at particular professions. Is the international comparison the same? Is it always the same professions in which people follow their parents? Or is that different across countries? That's a great question. I wish I had the comparative data across countries on occupational inheritance to, to test it more um, thoroughly. The data that I do have um, that is suggestive of um, a non-cultural explanation uh, from the comparative data is uh, other countries that experience electoral reform, like Japan. Uh, and a case that's easy to point to, because you can see it in the figure, is the um, case of S Switzerland here, the green line. It peaks here, and then there's a drop. And that drop was when Switzerland changed their electoral system from a local um, uh, system where personal reputation mattered to a closed list proportional representation system where votes were cast based on, the, on party rather than individual candidates. So like Japan, you see a shift um, with the new institutions towards uh, fewer local notables, including dynasties, getting uh, uh, elected. Yeah. Yeah, it would be great to know cross-nationally uh, what is the relative um, uh, relative over um, 
uh, abundance of political occupational inheritance uh, uh, compared to uh, other, other fields, and, and systematically what types of uh, professions are, are more or less likely to have um, uh, occupational inheritance occur. Another great project for some, uh, uh, yeah, somebody who can get the data. To the extent that you've had an opportunity to gather them, what have been the reactions in Japan uh, to your bottom line conclusions? And have you had a chance to go back to any of your interviewees and uh, sort of show them your conclusions and see what their reactions have been? And have they been surprised or given you any kind of interesting feedback or, oh, we all knew this or anything like that? No, none of them will refer return my phone calls anymore. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I think that. Um, in Japan, there there was an, an impression that dynasties were just rampant and that there there hadn't been any change. And hopefully, that th the contribution that I can make uh, with my book is a little bit more of a nuanced picture. That yes, there are still dynasties, but it's not the same types of dynasties uh, that were prevailing under the old uh, system. Uh, and slowly but surely, uh, the overall numbers of dynasties are uh, is declining. Um, most of the politicians I interviewed uh, thirty. 30 or so politicians from different parties um, in the LDP, DPJ, Komeito, and then uh, a few of the other parties, Ishin, and um, uh, this, this research was conducted before Kibo existed. Um, but most of those politicians were sort of unsurprised by um, the phenomenon of dynasties. Um, and then when I told them that I had analyzed the data and um, saw a decline, uh, were you know surprised and um, and thought it was a good thing. Um, so uh, hopefully some of them will, will read the book. Um, I, I, should, I should tell them that it's on sale now through Sunday for 30% off, <laughs> and they can buy a copy, and I'd be happy to sign it next time I visit them. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, just generally the advantages that Dynasty um, gives um, and the way that those have changed with the electoral system. I, I'm curious if you could um, Elaborate. I mean, my my impression is that in Japan, it's hard to if, if if you are in the LDP and you have this network, the Koenkai, that that's very valuable for fundraising. If you don't have that, you're dead in the water. The elections period is very short. There are very strict rules on if you're going to like legally raise money for your campaign. It's very difficult to do that. Um, are there things in other than just the change between the old multi-member to the single member and proportional list that, that um, play into the, the prevalence of dynasties? Yeah, so one thing that's interesting is I, in the chapter on the electoral advantages of dynasties, I actually compare um, the uh, likelihood of, of winning uh, your election uh, pre and post reform. And one of the key takeaways that is perhaps um, you know, uh, promising for the, the direction of, of Japanese politics, uh, if, at least if you think that parties should be um, you know, strong and represent something to the electorate, is that the LDP candidate uh, in any given district, the, the biggest predictor of whether they're going to win is the LDP's strength in that district, and not the strength that's related to their personal uh, vote, uh, the strength that the party has as a party. Um, in that in that district, and so in the places where you're still getting uh, legacy candidates nominated, uh, I argue that the LDP could basically nominate whoever they want, and still have a good chance of winning that seat. They don't need to rely on the legacy candidate. If a legacy candidate wants to run, the party has no reason to say no, go away. If that candidate is also good quality, uh, if that candidate is not looking to be good quality, they can nominate somebody if they want, and if the party is stronger in that district, they'll win anyway. Um, and so the encouraging part of that is that um, the party doesn't necessarily have to rely so much on their legacy candidates for, for the ability to win uh, district races. So. Okay, uh, we, have, we, have, we have time for one short question and one short answer, if you want to conclude. So does anybody have a short question? Another long question. No. The, yeah. book, the book does have a, um, well, it has an e-book, which I assume can be read on Kindle. Yeah. 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 Okay, do you want to conclude or? Just thank you all so much for uh, spending your evening with me. I really enjoyed our, our conversation. Thank you for coming out. Well, th thank you very much. Um,
as, as I said over dinner, I really like your book because you use a lot of data, but with a historical political perspective. It reminded me of the Lipset book on uh, why it didn't happen here and why there's no socialism in America. We also uses a lot of data, but takes into account historical and political factors. So I really recommend it to you, and if you're teaching Japanese politics, I think it's a, it's a perfect book for advanced undergraduates or graduate students. Uh, so thanks again, and uh, we'll see you soon, and uh, thanks to Dan. Thank you.